Alrighty guys, welcome. This is our third episode of our podcast, Two Minds, One Podcast. So, today we have a couple topics, you know, the usual. Um, we'll be going over them. Um, so, sit back and enjoy. Alright, so today, I want to talk to you about um, nuclear energy. Because I learned something new. Oh, funny enough, I recently went through a nuclear kick this week as well. I was doing a bunch of research and just finding out about all the crazy catastrophes that have happened uh-huh. recently and how nuclear energy is, you know, statistically cleaner than coal, petroleum, gasoline, and natural gas. But it's funny okay. enough that you bring that up. So, nuclear energy, right? And this is the uh, fission one, right? The one where they, they shoot uh, electrons or they shoot an at a... At a uh, Atom, they shoot an electron and an atom, right? Or a proton to split it, right? That's not how it works. Well, well I know that's not how it works. They get one to split, which then releases another. Um, so let's go over how they work first. Right. Because I did a little bit of research on that. Yeah. So the way nuclear reactors work mm-hmm. is the way they do do that. No, no, no. Right? So they take so, the uranium, right? The uranium. I know, I know it. I just, I got to get it straight. <laughs> but okay. continue. Okay, they take okay. the... So they work in essence. Uh-huh. The nuclear reactor works. It's very simple. Generates electricity like every other way known to mankind to generate electricity. Mm-hmm. It uses water, uses a oh, turbine, yeah, and it yeah. uses steam. I know steam. that. That's not what the part that so I'm the talking way, about. So the way a nuclear reactor works uh-huh. is that there are rods of you know the fuel, aka the uranium, right? These rods have water that run through them to cool them to regulate the amount of reaction that's happening, the amount of heat generated, right? Mm-hmm. These rods get close to each other, they're radiating and they're generating heat. Yeah, right? no, well, they're, they're, that's what that's, but that's the part that I was talking about because I know how the nuclear facility works, right? Basically works with heat and steam to power, well, let, let's, right? Let's, to let's, create let's, the electricity. Okay, but I was talking about specifically the uranium rods, right? The way they work is when they get close, when they're close in proximity to each other, they're constantly spewing out um, neutrinos neutrinos right because they're they're decaying yes. right those neutrinos hit other atoms which split those which split more neutrinos that's what i forgot was the word neutrinos you reminded me right okay so what i found out was that when those rods are spent they're done right because mm-hmm. they end up being like little pellets right mm-hmm. they're like yay big or something they say right something like that or, or not yay big but right they're small in what we it compared to what we imagine so they get spent and most of that wasted uranium that is now used up fuel mm-hmm. is actually still 85 percent of that is still usable or 80 percent or something like that it's still usable uranium mm-hmm. okay but we don't use it well at least here in in, in the united states right Mm-hmm. I learned that in the 60s, it didn't mention where they recycle the waste mm-hmm. and reuse it to create electricity. Again, to renew, make new rods and take out the actual stuff that's waste, right, mm-hmm. on the rods and create new uranium rods mm-hmm. and put them back into production. So basically a cycle. Right, and by doing that, it cuts down the 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 lifespan, the decay life, drastically, from tens of thousands of years, right, to hundreds of years, which is much easier to store. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay, so that's what I learned, and there's a country that already does this. Let me guess. Norway. No. I have no idea then. Japan. Oh. Japan's nuclear reactors, they have nuclear reactors and then they have, are designed, so their nuclear reactors are are done in that, that style of the 60s, which is designed to recycle the uranium and reuse it. So they're reusing the nuclear waste that they generate. Part of the nuclear waste is generated... Right? Yeah. And then they have very small waste 
that ends up being left over, which is the stuff that isn't used one or more, and it's way more dangerous stuff. Um, and the lifespan of those things, the decayed life, is shorter in the hundreds of years. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I was not expecting you to tell me about that. Um, but for those of you who don't know how nuclear reactors work, the control rods that Raymond's talking about, uh, when they're placed next to other uranium control rods, sorry, not the control rods, fuel rods, when the fuel rods are placed next to other uranium fuel rods, they generate heat. This heat, right, then changes the water that is cooling them from water to steam. And this steam is then funneled, right? Because it's going to raise, you know, higher energy, so it's going to float to the top. It is then funneled, and it spins a turbine. And this turbine then generates electricity. And that steam is collected after it's spun through the turbine through these giant condensers, which are the giant things that you see nuclear reactors, the, the big pillar things. If you've ever seen pictures of a nuclear reactor, you know, the big thing, mm-hmm. the big dome thing. That's actually just a giant condenser. And so what it does is it condenses the steam that was used by the, you know. The, yeah, to spin the to spin, to spin, the, to spin the, the turbine. Mm-hmm. The condenses turbine. it back into water to get sent back, cooled, and back into, you recycled and reused. Yeah. Right? While a good portion, there is a portion of the water that is technically radiated and contaminated. That portion of the water is separated and, you know, and cleaned out, you know. But um, mm-hmm. that's the way all traditional nuclear reactors work and then you have the control rods which step in in conjunction with the water to stop the reaction to stop the reaction yeah to stop the neutrinos from hitting the other yes to stop the the, the, the feedback loop yeah right but this is the control rods don't work in the sense of how you think they would work they work it's not like a it's not like putting water on a fire it just instantly turns it off no it slows it it down slows it down yes it slows it down right. and you have to continuously wait and you still have to be continuously feeding water even while it's you know cooling down to continue cooling it off because the reaction is still happening it's just its rate is decreased right and so it's slowly like it's like the embers of a fire it's slowly cooling off and yeah like a fire time. pit like You're a fire about, pit yeah. yeah and so you have to continuously feed water to it right mm-hmm. and um a lot of interesting things can actually happen inside chambers of nuclear uh, power plants. First really? of all, they're like insanely over-engineered and overbuilt because of their dangerousness. Normally, like talking like six, eight inches of steel inside the chamber where the water and the rods are all going to be stored, mm-hmm. right? And underneath that, you normally have anywhere from like two to six feet of concrete before it reaches, you know, the other pad of concrete. Yeah, where I heard it sits, sits upon, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's really interesting. We've actually had very few nuclear reactor scares in the history of, uh, you know, mankind. There's actually only a couple. There's like, the book. so, there's for nuclear disasters, there are levels similar to how there are levels in a hurricane or a tornado right like a level seven hurricane is like insane katrina level like you know decimate right? yeah okay. and so you know nuclear disasters um also rank on that scale right and you know it goes from one to seven right and i forget the the scaling names the the you know one is like you know x y and two blah blah, blah right but the level seven disasters that people think of and which is what most people think of when they think of nuclear disasters yeah they think of chernobyl chernobyl and the japan yeah the meltdown. one yeah the one hit with the tsunami you mean the earthquake and the tsunami oh, oh yeah the earthquake and the tsunami right yes yeah um, so those are the only two recorded level seven incidences of nuclear reactor failures ever in the history of mankind right obviously we're not classifying hiroshima and nagasaki as a nuclear disaster because mm-hmm. those are also on par of level seven in the contamination and you know the irradiation and the amount of you know radiation that's left over from it but we're talking about just nuclear reactor events right not atomic bombs 
right? Mm-hmm. Which are similar but different. You know, one's a force for generating electricity, and one's a force to decimate everything in its way. Um, so, there's only been two ever, right? And the two are the Chernobyl accident, right? Yeah. Which was due to a combination of human error and poor engineering and lack of oversight. And then there is the Japan incident. The majority on that one was human error, no? It's a combination of things. It's it's human error. You know, I'm sure... I don't know if you guys have ever seen the uh, HBO saying, Max. I know it's a combination of things. It's but... the HBO Max series, Chernobyl. If you haven't, I highly recommend you watch it. It's a phenomenal show. It does a very good job of retelling the events of what happened. Long story short, what happened in Chernobyl is they were trying to increase the output of the reactor to meet increasing demand. So they can say, you know, the reactor is rated for, the design rated for X amount of gigawatts, you know, mm-hmm. or terawatts of power. Yeah. But if you can prove that it's worth, you know, if it, was, if it was worth 10 terawatts, if you can prove that it can, you can, you can actually squeeze 15 terawatts out of it, you know, by running it in this configuration, mm-hmm. you know, essentially blurring the lines on the margins of, you know, safety, of whatnot, yeah. right? Pushing it to its limits. Like, kind of like how you do any engine, you know, you can, yeah. you can run it at its, you know, normal operating, you know, procedure. And then there's like the, the limits where you're, where you can squeeze a little bit more, but the probability of, you know, something going wrong or, you know, it's lifespan, you know, decreases. Yeah. Um, increase wear and tear. So during those tests, the crew that was running this test was inexperienced and the conductor running the test um, was essentially lacking oversight in the sense of understanding what needed to be done and you know what happens what could happen when you know they don't follow proper safety precautions and because he's trying to run this test he was you know mitigating a lot of the safety precautions which Mm -hmm. led to the you know, reactor meltdown and literal explosion of the, you know, oh, yeah, the no, reactor. The because because what happens is the, the water, the water, when they hit the safety valve, right, to, so, okay, so then another thing about nuclear reactors, you have your, your pump that's pumping in water that's, that's being converted to steam to generate energy. If for some reason that were to accidentally, you know, stop, normally a lot of these nuclear reactors have emergency tanks where it just fills the entire chamber with water right it floods it mm-hmm. and starts to instantly decrease your reaction right but if you know your reactor has been going on for too long and it's already too hot if that emergency you know water gets sent out right it it'll, it'll instantly turn to steam it'll instantly vaporize like if you've ever had a really hot skillet and you throw water on there and it goes tss, and you see it bubble up and instantly yeah, instantly. Mm-hmm. instantly vaporizes so what happened chernobyl was the water that was set the emergency to stop the reaction instantly vaporized causing instant rapid expansion of the water yeah blew the top off it blew the top off and then it left the core exposed with nothing you know nothing stopping it because they they put the safety they put the safety water in they put the control rods in however the other major issue was with their control rods their control rods were this is Russia and the Soviet Union so they're trying to make things you know, relatively cheap, you know, in skimping. Mm-hmm. And these control rods did their job, but there was a specific material that the entire control rod is supposed to be made out of. A large majority of the control rod was made out of that. However, the tips of these control rods, you know, that normally don't see a lot of action, were made of a slightly less compatible material, where it was compatible for a small duration, but otherwise it, you know, could become increased fuel for the nuclear reaction. And so when they slammed the control rods in, the control rods actually got jammed. It's only the tips of the control rods, the parts that you wouldn't want, you know, to mm-hmm. be stuck in there, feeding to try and slow down the reaction. So they slowed down the reaction for a bit, and then they actually fed into the reaction. And then the nuclear reactor had a literal meltdown, as in the fuel rods Yeah, all the fuel melted. rods and the control rods melted, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And so when... Your fuel rods in our nuclear reactor melt and they mix with water, sand, concrete. They create this thing, I believe it's called. It starts with a C. It's like a coronium or something like that. But long mm-hmm. story short, 
it's the best contender for the deadliest substance known to mankind. Shit's volatile. It's mm-hmm. All kinds of bad. Right. And so the, the Chernobyl disaster was a combination of all of those things. You know, the perfect storm of, you know, a non regulated crew who just blindly following orders because they don't fully understand the system, a person who was willing and thought they overconfident, removed safeguards from the reactor. You know, the fact that, you know, the reactor wasn't a hundred percent built to the level of specifications that are required, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, poor timing and poor mechanical failures, right? So it's a combination of a lot of things, right? But the way it was handled, right, is a whole nother situation. But back to what we were talking about, there's only been two major disasters like that level. The second yeah. one was Japan. Mm-hmm. Japan's nuclear, you know, reactors, nuclear power plant was on the coast, mm-hmm. right? A lot of access to a lot of water. Yeah. Makes sense. Right? Japan's a very hilly, mountainous, you know, country. Doesn't have a lot of flat land. A lot of the flat land is already being used by its population. Um, So that nuclear reactor is actually significantly better designed than, you know, most because it was designed in post, the post-Cold War, essentially, era. Mm -hmm. Right? And so it was overbuilt and it was designed to withstand a tsunami. Mm -hmm. It was also designed to withstand an earthquake. However, unfortunately, it was not designed to withstand a tsunami and an earthquake on the same day, <laughs> at the same time, essentially. A double whammy. You literally. Is it? Yeah. Right? Wild. So, because, so what happened with the Japan nuclear reactor was it got hit with an earthquake. They shut it down. They shut down the reactor. They inserted the control rods, you know, they started fl- pumping the water, right? But then the tsunami hit. The tsunami hit, cut power. So now their emergency power is also gone because they lost power from the grade when the earthquake hit. Yeah. Because it was a magnitude nine something earthquake. So I think it was a third So they were already earthquake. on backup. They were the backup right? generator power. Then they lost that power. So then all the water that was cooling off the pumps, that was feeding the water to cool off, you know, to finish off cooling off the reactions, right, stopped. So guess what happened? Their nuclear reactor started to keep going because it mm-hmm. ran out of water because it had steam right and so another thing that happens inside nuclear reactors sometimes is that the nuclear reaction actually reacts with the the water it's in the neutrinos and the neutrons being sent out by the nuclear reaction right hits the water molecule and breaks apart the hydrogen and the oxygen and you get a buildup of hydrogen gas and now we all know hydrogen, hydrogen gas is flammable. flammable yeah right it's what the mm-hmm. sun burns on Come on, guys. So, long story short, hydrogen gas built up. There was an unfortunate spark, you know, pressure, detonation, increasing mm. pressure. You know, eventually two things are going to collide. You have atomic molecules, and boom. Boom goes the reactor. Yeah, but I heard that the Japan one, the reactor, it, it stayed all within the reactor. It stayed within its... It's designed. It's designed like containment. They had, a, they, yes. had a, 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 they had a containment safety area underneath the reactor. In yes. case something happened, it would fall in there and yes. stay yes. there. And, and yes. it actually that is what worked. Happened. Yes. Right? But it did have a catastrophic failure. Yeah. And it did spew out tons of radioactive smoke, smoke gas yeah. into the surrounding areas, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah. But interesting, it's these kinds of situations that has really warped public perception of what this and nuclear bombs is what warped public public the public perception of nuclear power away from it being the future right because when it was first discovered when it was first discovered yeah no 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 hold on Uh when it was first discovered it was the future Mm -hmm. then it got turned into a weapon Mm -hmm. it had dangerous you know small but increasing incidences of how dangerous you know you know radiation is because Mm -hmm. it is the silent killer. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't taste it. You don't know it until it's too late. It doesn't yep. take a lot to kill you, and it stays with you for the rest of your life if you do get affected by it. Yeah. Right. There's a reason why you have lead vests. When you go to the doctors when they do MRIs or X-rays and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. There's you know there's a reason why it's very regulated. There's an entire regulations committee for well, regulating because I mean, they've know, had accidents and they know substances. how how bad it is. Yes. Yeah. But how it's dangerous. all of these. It's all these dangerous singular incidences that 
stay alive in public perception when they think of nuclear power plants because there has been a significant shift in our power grid system to shift away from nuclear energy because they believe that it is dangerous, which it can be. They believe that it is harmful, which it can be. And they believe that it is just bad, essentially. It has a bad, you know, mm-hmm. bad taste in the public's mouth, right? Which is interesting because when you look at it, the you take, you know, nuclear energy out of the equation, right? You're going to have to increase, you know, your energy oh. output from coal, natural gas, and mm-hmm. oil, which we all know generate a shit ton of CO2, and which we all know are directly linked to significant we don't all know well i don't know about the natural gas but the the way you mine natural gas a lot of times is by fracking yeah guess what you do with fracking yeah dude you drill a big ass hole in the ground and you throw bombs in there Mm -hmm. guess what happens sometimes when you do fracking you light the natural gas you're going after you light it on fire crazy is it any useful to you when it's being lit on fire no no it's not so so when you look at a piece of coal and you look at a piece of you know, plutonium or, or uranium, right? Same size. We'll say a softball size coal, yeah. a softball size piece of uranium. Uh-huh. Softball size coal, we'll say it has a million joules of energy, right? This is just a number off the top of my head. I'm not claiming that it has a million joules yeah, of energy. It, it's an example. Right? I get it. The uranium. Well, 23 million times the amount of energy. Yeah. So it's energy per unit density is significantly higher. And we're not taking advantage of this. Why? Because we're scared. I understand I don't... that it is... No, let me... Hold up. I understand mm-hmm. that it is... That when nuclear disasters happen, it's bad. And I understand it can be really bad. I understand that. But... The same can be said for oil spills, coal mines, and, you know, natural gas. Mm -hmm. When you look at the statistics, the number of people that have died from nuclear disasters related to power plant, essentially, Uh and the number of people that have died to coal, oil, and natural gas, it's significantly lower. I think it's like twenty five or 250,000 for... For nuclear and it's like in the millions for so for coal and natural gas and oil right mm-hmm. and it's like we've known that you know but i think you're misreading the situation here i don't think and all honestly i don't think the people who have the funds or have the investment to do nuclear power plants here because in america i'm gonna say america i know that in japan they they have a lot of most of their comes from power comes from nuclear. You want to why? But hold on. it's just smarter. It, no, it is. I'm not. Let me finish. You know, let me let me tell you. And they use the recycle method because they know that it is the cleanest source, and they don't have a lot of territory and a lot of resources to be able to use now, right? But it's the cleanest. Now here in America, and the reason I think that it hasn't gotten that big are two things, because. The, I forgot who it was, in the 60s or in the 70s, the president wrote and stopped any continuation into the recycle uh, miners, the recycle nuclear power plants. Mm-hmm. The ones built and designed to use the energy, create, use the fuel, create the energy, recycle the rods. It's like a closed loop system, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. The biggest hurdle that we're having here, I don't think it's that the... the 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 majority's prospect on on the way no, they look at it's a hundred percent public perception no i think not a, it's not a hundred percent i don't think it's hundred i think okay the largest problem is the storage of the nuclear waste okay i can okay hear hold me up, hold up hold up because I, I see your point it's so let me ex- tell you how it's stored how expensive right no because of how expensive it is to store it it's cheaper to store than you think okay and you have to keep picking new places. No, you don't. You know where most nuclear waste is stored? On a power plant? Stored on site. You know what to do with it? Let me tell you what they do with it. In the product of, you know, running a nuclear power mm-hmm. plant, 
Stuff's gonna get irradiated. Stuff's gonna get contaminated. What they do is they collect it, put it inside this essentially steel capsule, pour a shit ton of concrete on top. By the way, that steel capsule is lined with lead on the inside and the outside, just so you know. Lead stops the, you know, reaction. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's right? what the, uh, the control rods. I don't think the control rods are made out of lead, but I think they're made out of some material. But I do know lead slows down the reaction. You know, yeah, it, I think it, it reduces was, it's lead and something else, if I remember right? correctly. But. Could be wrong. Uh-huh. Then they take that. They turn it into essentially the, a silo. That silo then gets stacked on top of other silos. Right? And, you know, they pour so much concrete. I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking like 18 inches. No, I know. I, of concrete. I've seen how they... You know, a silo. And that's stored in its little section, you know, and it has a half-life of however long. And 85% of nuclear waste that is generated on a power plant will, its half-life, you know, it will no longer be radioactive by the time that plant is designated to be shut down. So if mm. the power plant is, 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 if the power plant has a life of 100 years... Yeah, but that's the small waste. I'm talking there about... There is no large waste. The, the, okay. the spent fuel rods? The spent fuel rods the get ones. recycled. No, they don't. Not in America. Okay, just because... That's what okay, I'm trying here, to tell you. Okay, in I, America. I what you're saying. I'm saying I here in America. What you're saying. I understand what you're saying. They don't get recycled. Okay, I and understand. And so then those are stored. How long does the control rod, fuel rod last, though? Okay. How long does it last? I don't know how long it lasts. Couple decades. And if we know, look, I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm not saying that. And that's that the problem. Their the, their half life is enormous. When left alone, their half life is enormous. Yes. Yes. If they're recycled and reused, then we can cut their half. But they don't do that here in America. Okay. Is what I'm trying to say. Here, here where we live, they don't do that. And I think that's the biggest problem here, which is why we haven't. That's, I don't think that's right. the biggest problem. Right. Why are nuclear reactors getting shut down? Public perception. People don't like living 25 miles away from a potential Chernobyl. Yeah, I mean... That's why. It doesn't... You don't... People don't feel safe. That's what it is. And so they lie. They, they make those feelings known. Okay. What happens? But then, then you come into a, the situation... People know how bad oil is. People know how bad coal is. And yet they don't care that they burn that. They don't like... Okay. And they know. There's people that fight okay. against it. Okay, okay. But the, peop- the people in the Hear industry keep using it. What do humans like? So what's like? the difference? What do they know? What do they know? You know? Short term or long term? Oh, no. They, they never look at the long term. Yeah. It's yeah. short term. Short term gain. What is going to affect me now? That, but that's not what I'm talking term. about. I'm talking about the people who... How many people are trying to stop big oil? Not right? Like they say, big oil. Right? Have they done anything? And there's how many people say big oil is bad? How many? All this is horrible, right? But they keep chucking forward. They don't care. Big oil doesn't care. They yeah, keep you don't know why? Because so where why is not happening? Majority of why our energy, energy that electricity comes from coming from. Why aren't they doing that with nuclear? It's already locked. Well, you see what I'm saying? So why I feel like they should look more into that, into into turning the to towards recycle, because the cleanest energy we can get, other than solar, and wind, right, and wind and thermal is. Is nuclear, right? Yes, that's what I'm saying. No, I, I, and I'm I believe that. That's what I'm advocating for. I'm not right? saying that, you know. But I also understand that out of the two major, are you sure that uh, there might be another? But those are the two major ones that I know of, right? That you well, know of. Those are the only ones that you, that are considered a level seven disaster. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There might be one more. I possibly. I don't want to. Speak with the ultimate certainty. Yeah, but as but, far as I know, they'll, those are the ones, and, that, and that's what I'm saying. Because like, look at the a magnitude. natural one. Look at the magnitude. No, I know, but uh, what I'm trying to say is a natural one. A natural like, what? A, a, one with a natural cause of it: earthquake and a tsunami. Like 
kind of unavoidable. You know what I mean? You could put it anywhere and it might still behave in an earthquake. You know the risks of putting it near the water, but it's the best option, right? You have the most amount of access to water mm -hmm. to cool it. Because otherwise you'd have to bring water to the location mm -hmm. of the power plant and consistently bring it. Because even though you recycle the steam, some of it, some of that water still, you know, you might lose a little bit, of, a small percentage of it, right? Like you said, a little bit mm -hmm. of it gets, gets uh, radioactive, right? So you got to separate it. So you got to constantly be bringing water. Yes. So your best source would be how often do tsunamis happen? And how likely is that tsunami is going to hit in the area where you okay, have yeah, the I nuclear understand reactor? That, you know where, are you, where, are you, where are you taking this? And that's what I'm, I'm taking this as in it's still the fact that out of all these years that we've been had nuclear and only one of the major ones has been caused by natural. Obviously, if we can, the human error ones that lead to their in Chernobyl, right? That lead towards that, plus mechanical errors, which you can account for human, because it should be maintained yes. by us. And yes. if it's not maintained, then you're gonna get mechanical errors. Yes. Okay. This is why I say that that's mostly a human error one, right? Mm -hmm. um, those are the more likely ones that happen versus a natural disaster one that was caused by nature, right? Okay. And those are, those are more preventable. Yes. By hiring competent individuals. Yes. Right? Yes. So I think that we should I think should advocate for it more is what I'm saying. Because it is more avoidable. Like the it, the, well, the, the, the well, out the, of the causes of the level seven, like you said, the one so if we can get rid of the human error one or reduce that one, right? Then we only have one that we would be more likely to worry about which is less likely to happen you can't yes i understand you, you, you can plan, plan for I'm natural tough. causes I understand what you're but you can't plan for natural causes like you can but you, you can, can't yes you can but you you can't plan for the specific dice roll that like, yeah but you, the you, world has set up for you like you said japan mm -hmm. planned for earthquake and they planned for tsunami <laughs> but they didn't plan to be here at the same time by both exactly that's what i'm saying like those are natural causes that we can't do nothing about yeah. And it's really hard to predict those. We're not at that level yet, right? At least... We'll never be at the level to predict the future of that level, dude. Right. But That's insane. ultimately, what I wanted to say was that nuclear energy gets a bad rap, right? Yeah. And I think that... I feel like it's a bad rap, too. If people were more informed and, you know, did some research and looked at, yes, it is very powerful and it is very destructive when not handled with care. But, I mean, the same could be said for the sun. Tell you not to look at the sun. Don't stare at the sun. The sun's really great. It does a lot of things for us. It's still, even how far we are, it's still really dangerous. You stare at it for 15 minutes, yeah, you're going to go sun, blind. The but sun listen, is a little, I'm, okay, making, yeah. I'm making an example, yeah, okay? But, uh, you, if you... Kind of a wrong, I think, comparison. But I get what you're saying. I think people would get what you're saying. Right. But the point is, in the world where you build the perfect nuclear reactor where it's maintained well and blah 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 and you build mm -hmm. a perfect you know for example oil mine or coal mine right the coal mine is going to lead to significantly more deaths via directly or indirectly through pollution mm -hmm. right and it's just going to give you i mean if you less energy overall less energy overall while the nuclear reactor has the higher risk I understand that of being completely detrimental and this isn't having a really bit when it's bad it's really bad I'm talking mm, really bad yeah right it has that risk mm -hmm. which is why it's so regulated and so controlled etc cetera, etc cetera. but when it's done well it's just the better option no overall it's the better option because it's it's much cleaner you're not you're not slowly killing everybody on the planet in the long term, like coal yeah. and oil. You're not heating up well, the, if you, the plant. I, I feel, if we look at all the oil spills that we've had, if you count the deaths from the oil spills of animals just look that at the, they've killed, just look at the it death would, of the humans indirectly through pollution. It would be way more than what you got from Chernobyl and, well, I don't know. I mean, they've had... No, it's significant. They have, yeah, they have generational problems, but yeah. We've been burning coal since the 1800s, man. 
We're going oh, on yeah. 200 and some 50 years. Yeah. Come on. But, anyway. That's what I'm saying. Like, look at the oil spills. How many animals died in that? Right? A lot. And there's and oil there's spills been, that happen all the time. Th- yeah, there's a bunch of oil spills. Look at Deepwater Horizon. The ginormous you know I mean? oil spill. Catastrophic failure. On a, you know. Gulf of Mexico? Rig. Yeah. But, enough about that. Speaking, I told you a bit on nuclear kicks. So I did yes. some research into that. I've been doing research into other instances where, you know, radiation and, you know, nuclear substances have played a role in. Okay. Fun fact. Didn't know this. During World War Two. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. There were these... I think it was World War One or World War Two. Doesn't one during one of the World Wars? There was uh, a company that developed, you know, gear for the military. Okay. And they used this substance called radium. Radium. I'm telling you right now, from the name, sounds like it would be radioactive. Radioactive radium. Mm-hmm. Kind of you know, kind of sounds like it. But they would use this as a paint, essentially. It's a it's a green substance, so, mm-hmm. and it kind of glows in the dark, right? Naturally, because it's radioactive, because uh-huh. it's emitting light through its yeah, it's emitting uh-huh. okay, yeah, decay. And so, what would happen is that you know during this time, I believe this was World War Two, and they this company hired women to essentially paint radium on watch faces dials and all of the substances they're used they're manufactured gauges and stuff like that they're going to mm-hmm. use at night for the military to use you know during their war yeah and you know they paint them by hand right you know assembly line you know you grab a piece dip it dip it in your radium you paint it right yeah. and um this is during this time they were told that the best method you know that they learned to get the the tip of your brush to paint well is to stick it in your mouth and you know, kind of like make a point, mm-hmm. you know? And so, guess what they did? They took their pen, they put it in the radium, they brushed it. The time, they didn't know, and they were told, right, that it was not radioactive, and they were told that it's not bad for them. Mm-hmm. However, all the telltale signs that it was not something you should be ingesting were there. Why? Because... The people who brought them their radium were in a lead suit with lead gloves handling it with care. Mm-hmm. The company, by the way, I don't remember the name, knew. Right? But it was, you know, pretty much a fad of the time. And radium was put in all kinds of things. We're talking tonics. We're talking sodas. We're talking toothpaste. Mm-hmm. Right? And slowly, these girls, right, would realize that... Their clothes after work would be glowing. Why? Because they'd get little dust particles, mm-hmm. you know, and bits of radium on there. And so they started going to the nightclubs after work. By the way, they were paid handsomely. Well, I'm talking. Well, I'm talking about like in the top five. <laughs> no, no, no. no uh-huh. top, I'm talking like top five percent, you know, of, you know, income during that time. Yeah. Right? So they're paid really well, right? Yeah. And there's so it was a secret hazard pay. <laughs> it's secret hazard pay, more likely. <laughs> Yeah. But um and so these girls would go out to the clubs and they were known as radium girls mm-hmm. because they would glow green when their lights would come off, you know, and you see them dancing. Their clothes? Their clothes would glow green and then eventually after working there for long enough, they the girls would notice that they themselves would glow green. The reason was because they were ingesting copious amounts of radium, mm-hmm. right? And so what happens is, you know, your body starts, you know, trying to sweat it out and, you know, push it out because it's harmful to you. Mm-hmm. And so you have your own natural oil on your skin and it slowly gets pushed out to the surface and they say they were glowing. Well, apart from the really cool, you know, club effects and sick dresses. Glow in the dark. Glow yeah, in the dark. Cosmo nights. Cosmo nights. Slowly, you know, they've noticed that, you know, these girls. Start getting you, sick? Start getting sick. They are like, man, my tooth really hurts. My jaw hurts. You know, and slowly but surely, the effects of the radium or the radium was coming into effect. Every single girl that worked there, you know, was affected by this. And it was at first kind of like, oh, that's crazy, you know. 
and it was noticed by I can't remember this lady, but it was noticed because her friend complained about a toothache and she lost a tooth. Went to the dentist, got the tooth pulled, mm-hmm. was fine, and then another tooth, and then another tooth, and then her jaw, and then she died. And this wasn't the only person. This happened to countless women, mm-hmm. right? And the company knew, right, that it was radioactive, but they didn't say anything. They said in small amounts what they're working with, you know, it wasn't radioactive, but it was, especially if it's directly ingested. So they lied. They lied, uh-huh. right? And so this radium was used, and they continued to do this until the workers united, right? And they eventually got together and started protesting to prove that it was bad for them. And the FDA did more studies on radium and proved that it was harmful in its being being ingested and things like that, that it was not good for you, Mm -hmm. right? Which gave a really bad rap to this company. So then they, you know, went in and poured millions of dollars to prove the opposite. Mm -hmm. And so they got away with it the first time, but the women kept dying and they kept dying, you know? And so eventually, you know, they band together and protested and they worked towards, you know, no longer having radium be a substance that's used, mm-hmm. right? And this lasted, we're talking, until the 60s. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. Damn. That it wasn't until that they they won a lawsuit where they settled outside of court that they were going to get paid. All the people that worked, you know, that were still alive, that worked for the company, that deal, dealt with the radium, were going to get paid. And eventually, radium is not allowed to be used. No, imagine. In that sense, you know, so it's, 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 yes, I understand that these stories like these that are, you know, what people are afraid of, not knowing something's bad for you, because keep in mind, it took about a year or two for the effects of the radium to build up. Well, yeah, I mean, to, you're, for them to notice. It's right? like, it's like when you're just coolant, it never leaves your system, lead. Never leaves your system. Eventually, it just builds up and kills you. Yeah. Right? But Let's, imagine, imagine the, if any of those girls got pregnant. Oh. The babies. Exactly. Like. Exactly. Their husbands. Mm-hmm. Wild. Mm-hmm. So, on the topic of crazy stories with, you know, radiation, did more research on other stories Similar to this one. Hold on, hold on. I think radium is one of the byproducts of um, the nuclear waste in there. That it, from the fuel rods that you get after wasted fuel. I, I think if I'm I remember not correctly, I'm not 100% sure. sure. I think it was one. I'll have to look it up. I'd have to fact check you on that. Yeah. I can tell you that well, I'm xenon. Not even, I'm and, not saying it's a fact. I can tell you that xenon and argon. Let's see. Radioactive xenon and argon are byproducts of uh, nuclear reactors. And I can tell you that those are dispelled into the air right is, but their half-lives are five years and 15 years yeah respectfully but there are a lot of other cases not similar to that one that was a clay case of more like um osha right mm-hmm. that was more of an osha case you know with you know rights for workers and whatnot but there's a lot of other cases around the world where Radioactive substances have been known to cause, you know, large-scale panic or disasters or impacts. Okay, so spent nuclear fuel contains traces of minor actinids. These so basically, it's uranium, plutonium, and neptunium. America. Americinium? And I can't even pronounce these. <laughs> and yeah, so plutonium is the major one. That's yeah, the one that I so confused I, with radium. That that one's yeah, like if I remember super correctly, radioactive. So the way so the way radioactive right? things work is they you have if you have an element of let's say uranium, mm-hmm. I forget what number uranium is on the periodic table, but you have a material that is uranium and it's gonna irradiate off a neutron. Right, or, it, in, or as many neutrons, right, until it, you know, 
divulges into plutonium. Another one, yeah. Another and then one. plutonium is going to irradiate itself off until it goes or you know into the next one, and, and slowly, so forth, and, and so, so forth, forth, and so forth, right? But there have been a lot of other cases, you know, around the world, not similar to that. That was a workers' rights violation case, mm-hmm. right? Because the company was, you know, lying to them. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, that case was, you know, here in America, you know, oh, yeah. so, just then you know, but there have been other stuff where un, unregulated radioactive items have come into contact with the general public. So, unregulated radioactive items, anytime a radioactive item is bought, for example, an x-ray machine, for example, you know, uh... Uh, cancer treatment machine you know Mm -hmm. things of that nature they are regulated and they're bought you know with you know kind of like a almost like a gun but significantly more you know paperwork involved right and so the person who buys it for their business or whatever is responsible for you know if the business goes out of you know to properly disposing of it you know Mm -hmm. giving it to the proper regulatory committee right the nuclear regulatory committee Mm -hmm. well this all does also include third world countries, right? This committee involved, you know, because you mm-hmm. can sell, you know, doctors and, you know, yeah, Africa yeah. can buy, you know, an MRI machine from America or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. If they can afford it. So when a radioactive item has been, you know, no longer, had no longer has traceability on it, as in nobody knows where it is, nobody knows what happened to it, the owner of it died or something and didn't tell anybody about it. It is now classified as an orphan source. Yes, I did. I did. Sir, uh, did a little bit on this too. So a little bit of research. Orphan sources mm-hmm. have been are very dangerous because a lot of the time you don't know it's radioactive and you don't know it's an orphan source until it's too Wine. late. It's right, the deadly silent so, killer. Right, exactly. So one. One tale that I did some research on was in Brazil, there was a dental agency that had essentially an x-ray machine, Mm -hmm. went out of business. That x-ray machine used a radioactive substance, right, to do its x-rays, right? Oh, yeah. Because that's how x-rays are done. So, it went out of business, the building was condemned, and it was sectioned off by the, by essentially the local government. Mm -hmm. Well... The local junkers looking for scrap metal to junk to get some money broke into this you know broken down clinic now mm-hmm. which is just a building found this machine took it to the junkyard scrapped it in the process found a little container of the radioactive substance right they opened the container right they saw that it was glowing Right, very cool, like bluish kind of hue to it. Oh, right, and so they closed the container and sold it to the owner of the junkyard. Owner of the junkyard bought it from them, thought it's very cool, took it home, showed it to his family, showed it to his wife, right, and then you know, they're like, Oh, this is cool, and he kind of left it, you know, in his garage. And when he came back at night, you know, he noticed that it was glowing so before it was blue and now it's glowing blue and so he thought it must be some kind of you know really expensive magical crystal something you know lower income they don't really know about radiation too much you know if any at all so then he shows his family his entire family shows his daughter his mother his brother Mm -hmm. his friends and he shows them and he grits he gets a, a, a piece of it, you know, he dumps it all, and they start looking at it, and they're playing with it, and they're touching it. Their hands are glowing blue. It's oh, like magic man. fairy dust. Well, long story short, this town, this, where it happened, right? They, um, you know, human curiosity is, you know, one of our greatest strengths and one of our, you know, greatest weaknesses well, it has say. advantages and disadvantages and right? like anything else mm-hmm. human curiosity got the best of it and word spread fast a lot of people touch this dust 
it's about it was the volume of it was about a third of a soda can normal you know normal soda can size that's a lot for radioactive so that's enough to that's enough to kill a lot of people man oh well duh well yeah what happened was they spread it and they you know they talked about it they showed their friends and family etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm-hmm. their daughter was playing with it you know while she was eating her sandwich magical fairy dust she called it the mom the wife you know had also been playing with it and started throwing up one of the signs of radiation poisoning mm-hmm. she went to the doctor the doctor said you know you must have caught some you know infectious disease you know mm-hmm. slowly but surely more and more people started coming to this clinic and multiple clinics around the, the, the city with similar symptoms right it wasn't until the mother pieced it together right the wife of the original junk vendor pieced it together that when they came in contact with this material right the junkers also got sick no yeah the junkers yeah yeah, all of them them, right Mm -hmm. but the junkers wife when she pieced she's the one who pieced together that this material when it came into our lives is when we got sick so she packed up what was left of it in a bag and took it to the doctor, right? Mm-hmm. And said, this material is what's causing us, you know, the hurting us. Mm-hmm. Right? She placed it on a chair, right, in the office. Then he went and discussed with her. And earlier that day, he had gotten, that doctor had gotten a call from another doctor. They were talking about how their, their, their patients seem to exhibit signs of radiation poisoning mm-hmm. but they're like what what could be causing it so it wasn't until you know the doctor she said this is the substance that's causing this and the doctor said okay leave that substance there i'm gonna check you out and i'm gonna make some phone calls right because he has a hunch that it might be radiation so they call right the embassy you know mm-hmm. they asked the local government to send a radiographer out well they send, you know, this uh, guy who pretty much specializes in radioactive substances, right? He works for, like, the, mm-hmm. the agency. And he gets a Geiger counter, right? For all those of you who don't know what a Geiger counter is, it's the device that me- measures the levels of radiation. And so he was called, and it took him a day to fly in. And he goes, he stops by the local embassy, he checks out a Geiger counter from the government, goes to the building, the office, where this bag Mm-hmm. He's being held, and before he walks in, he turns on the Geiger counter. It instantly reaches, reads maximum value, that's available on it instantly. And he goes, "Huh, I shouldn't be doing that. It's broken." Turns around, goes back to the embassy, returns it, tells him it's broken. Asks for a new one, gets a new one, comes back, turns it on, instantly goes to the top again. Were these like low level readers? No. Well, because cause I know that with the Geiger counters, they have different, like, sizes. Yes. To raid higher amounts of radiation. Yes. Yeah. Well, this one instantly read the maximum amount. So even mm-hmm. if the maximum amount is five rads per minute, yeah. you're not supposed to be receiving that. At that far away. Exactly. Yeah. And so he finally diagnoses it to be the chair with the substance inside of it. Right? They evacuate. And they call in. Right? And they now he knows that they have a large-scale radiation poisoning. And they, you know, he starts to realize that multiple people have been touching items, clothes, other people, right? This thing just spread. It spread like a, like a, like a disease. Yeah. And so, ultimately, what they did is that they called anybody that had symptoms similar like that to the local stadium. The stadium held a hundred and thirty thousand people. Mm-hmm. A hundred and twelve thousand people showed up. That were potentially afflicted with, you know, radiation disease. What happened was that that chair was brought outside. They lowered a steel pipe over it, and they poured it. They poured concrete on top of the chair. No one touched what was left of the, you know, trace amounts of the radioactive substance, right? What substance was it? Fire. It starts with a C. It was uh. Oh, uh, it was a. Uh, I think I know which one you're talking about. Let me see. Chromium. I think it was chromium. No, or uh, 
Chromium. Yeah. Right? I think it's that one. Um, Chromium? I know. I just saw a video from. Uh, I don't know if you heard about that guy that that did a meme and he bought pretended to have a radioactive element on Twitter or something like that. Yeah. Put his hand on it. Cesium. Cesium. That's it cesium. cesium. So cesium is really radioactive. Dust. Yeah. Cesium. And so what happened was they sealed that surf that source of radioactive cesium off, and they you know got everybody that had the that had potentially been in contact with it in one location they got rid of their clothes but they did it they did a really good job of you know stopping the spread but the people who had already had it on their skin well, they're gonna die with it, they're gonna they're gonna die but they their body began to sweat out the cesium uh-huh. right and so their clothes became radioactive again and so ultimately Thousands of people were injured. Hundreds of people died. The little girl, who was five years old, playing what she thought was fairy dust while eating her sandwich, died. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is the That whole family of, died. Yeah. The father actually lived. What? He survived. He started. He survived and started a foundation, a nonprofit, mm-hmm. for informing lower-income houses and areas about the dangers of orphan sources and radioactive substances. Scarred. Yeah. He was scarred for the rest of his I life. I mean, imagine if he and didn't he have was that, it's your fault. And he dude. was ostracized by the people because they believed it to be his fault. I mean, in, in, but, in a sense it is, but not. Well, in a sense, yes, he is the one responsible but he didn't for know. bringing it up. How can and, you? But you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, you ignorance. You, can't you don't be, know what you don't know. You can't. You can be at fault for you know, but you you didn't. Yeah, you know. I heard there's 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 the government agencies for orphan sources that you got to get reported and. Yeah, orphan sources are a serious thing that uh, can do a lot of damage, especially because human nature's curiosity and other such things. But but yeah. It's it's crazy. I did see the video you were talking about about the guy from who was it? who was it? Um, the uh, he was talking about the the gentleman that had se- it was so there was a, twi- there's a, there's a tweet, a video, right? There was a video on Twitter and mm-hmm. Tumblr that yeah, went viral and Reddit where a guy was showing a radioactive substance. Right, would look to he, be a radioactive. Would look substance. to be a radioactive substance when he opened the lid. The video would get grainy. Yeah, right? get the and radioactive so, video grain. So when, when a video is being taken of a radioactive source that is unshielded, it does cause a film grain on the video. Mm-hmm. However, it's a very specific film grain. And when, you know, this was tracked down to be to figure out if this was an orphan source that just went viral across the internet, it turned out, no. No. It wasn't. No, he ain't It even... was a fake video, mm-hmm. and he used a stock f- f- film filter off of i think like adobe after effects or something like that yeah he even had a small piece he was a really smart guy. actually he was actually a radio uh he was a the person he worked in the field right person, he even had a small element because he had a guy go the Geiger, counter he had a geiger counter yeah and he placed it on on a really small substance that he had that was radioactive and it was reading like one or something really really small the point is yeah it was crazy. Imagine that was a real he would have first done. no a real first video social media of an orphan source poisoning somebody. It would have been be crazy. crazy. I mean, but in reality, it's only a matter of time before that happens. I don't think. I don't think that's no. Gonna, I don't think. Hopefully, it, hopefully I would like to believe doesn't it happen. doesn't because hopefully orphan doesn't. sources are a serious matter that. A lot of people don't know about and i know they're not super common but it is important to know that they exist just how it is important to 
understand that there are bad people out there. There are things that can kill you. This is one of those things that in this day and age that we live in where radioactive items, you know, could possibly come in contact, you know, at a junkyard, in an abandoned building, et cetera, et cetera. It is something that you should be aware of. Yeah, it, it's insane. But with that, guys, I think that's all the time we have left for today. Careful with your mic. <laughs> I know, I'm going to smack the shit out of it. But I hope you guys learned something. If you found this hope topic you guys enjoyed interesting, it. I would definitely recommend going out and doing some more research on, you know, orphan sources, cases, uh, nuclear disasters, and nuclear power in comparison to other things. This is just something that we were, you know, curious about that happened. We thought it'd be fun to share with you guys. But anyway, well, hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you guys next week. See you guys next week.